Was there a key thing that you looked at and said, okay, that right there changed the whole trajectory of what we were doing? Yeah, you know, for sure. I think we made some decisions uh, that other people don't early on. So like, just as a couple examples, we started selling before we had a product. Good. People go, what do you mean? Like, how do you like, well, you know, we didn't want to spend a year building something to show it to people just to get the feedback that it was wrong. So right. The first thing we showed people was a deck. Right. And we got feedback on that and iterated on the deck long before we ever built anything. Hey, welcome back to the show. We have got an Alex. And I don't know about you, but I've never met an Alex I don't like. Alex, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, thank you for having me. So uh, I'm the founder of a software business. Um, I've been in startups for a long time, but, you know, really like this early stage software business gig. Cool. And, you know, we at this point have been around for almost four years and I've been very lucky to grow quite quickly. And we, we sort of the North Star metric we use in our businesses, you know, are we helping our customers who are largely uh, the contact centers in big B2C brands? Are we helping them right. drive more revenue from their customers? And at this point, you know, we've driven more than $3 billion of revenue for them. And, you know, that's really what makes us happy is that it's, it's driving real value for our customers. I love it. I love it. Now, a lot of people talk the way you're talking, but let's get down to it. What are you actually doing with your software? Because I've looked into it. You've got some really, really cool feature sets that you're offering to companies who are leaving a lot of money on the table. What, what is it that you're actually doing? Yeah. If you step back, you know, the, the sort of first things that came online were all retail. And in that model, largely the playbook was, you know, have a site with a picture of the product and a price and reviews and free returns. And like, don't talk to your customer. Right, customer service was seen as a cost center. And most <laughs> software was looked at as how do I deflect customer interactions and you know remove those because yeah. they're, they're, there's no revenue there. Um, and I think that may, may be true in retail. Uh, what we right. found is you know everyone who shopped online, especially sort of was accelerated through COVID, now wanted to do other things online. So right. their healthcare, their banking, their insurance, you know, their education. And in these more considered spaces, there had always been a human being involved in that process because it's a bit more considered and complicated. And right. as those businesses shifted online, uh, if they didn't have a human being involved, there was a much worse ex experience as judged by the conversion rate. Literally, like if you were a bank, you know, somebody used to show up in person, 90% funded the account. Somebody opens a bank account online, 20% fund the account. That's a like, pretty business critical problem if you can't get people to trust uh, your website enough to go and actually put the money in the account. That's so huge. we, we experienced this in the home service in, industry and then met a lot of other businesses with the same experience. Uh, we struggled with the current contact center software. And so started Regal yeah. on the premise that there really should be somebody focused on building software for these high velocity contact centers, you know, that are actually, you know, really asking, how do I reach my customer? They're not asking, right. how do I ignore my customer? They're asking, how do I treat my customer better? How do I use a personal touch in a digital age? Right. And you know that was going to be our calling card. In terms of the specific insight as to how we were going to do it, yeah. largely um, in contact centers, you know, they were taught or we were taught, how do you treat everybody the same? Yeah. Right. How do you make it all efficient and all the same? Yeah. Marketing was very different, right? Marketing was taught, well, the more you can make things personalized and unique, the better the outcomes. Right. And so a lot of what we've done is bring a lot of the marketing capabilities into the contact center. So how do you have all the untapped customer data in one place? How do you then change how you're going to interact with the customer based off of that? How do you change what you're going to say based off of that? You know, based on what they'd say in the conversation, <laughs> how do you decide what's the best? And so that decisioning or orchestration is what makes us so different. So we call it a journey builder. Um, but, you know, things as simple as A-B testing didn't exist in a contact center environment. Nope, so now we didn't. can give them tools to A-B testing. So, you know, in the end, you know, that's really where we shine is in these teams that are proactively like trying to have conversations with customers to drive revenue right. and need tools, you know, need better data strategies to be able to go and do it. Right. So is your avatar the contact center owners or are they... Uh, clients that use contact centers for their lead follow-up and things like that? Who, who's your avatar? Yeah, look, we serve companies. So, you know, our, our customers are like AAA or SoFi or Angie's right. List or, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the big universities online work through these online right. program managers that we work with. So, uh, or in healthcare, you know, Roman or Forward, folks like that. 
they have contact centers, some of which are staffed by their employees, sure. some of which are staffed by third parties, but they control sure. the software. I love it. Now, this is such a valuable solution. Uh, having owned and operated a contact center for like 13 years, I definitely feel the pain that you're trying to solve here. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating than doing reaching out to a large list of people and nobody answering the phone, uh, high, high yeah. rates of no answers and send to voicemails, things like that. And what you're doing is you are creating a, a much more professional approach to blending that marketing and the contact center into, hey, here's who we are. Hey, we're calling. Guess who it is? And you're telling them exactly who it yeah. is. Look, the traditional softwares are like five nine, right. nice Genesis, which I've used, right, right. and nothing wrong with them for customer support. But you know, if you're, you know, when we interview customers who are using them, and we say, hey, you know, is your performance going to be better or worse in a year? Right. You know, are you going to drive more or less answer rate? Are you going to drive more or less revenue? Hundred percent of them say that it's going to be worse in a year, and they have no and no like light at the end of right. the tunnel, and so they're scrolling as fast as they can to call people more, 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 right. more, which is only making the problem worse. We offer them a different way and say, here's a completely different set of tools right. where you can use this untapped customer data to drive, you know, better engagement. And, you know, for sure the customers, you know, first couple hundred customers are the early adopters, sure. but we're starting to get into bigger and bigger brands. We're realizing that, you know, if they want to be the ones that care about customers, you know, and care about how they engage with them, they can't keep doing it the old right. way. They've got to switch to this new technology. Right, right. Well, obviously, like one of the big trends that I see that you're solving for is, you know, it used to be that people get a phone call, they answer it. Then it was, hey, this call is coming from an out of my area code number. I'm not going to answer it. And yeah. then it became, hey, everyone seems to have my area code. <laughs> They're calling from somewhere outside of my area code. And what you're doing now, one of, the, one of the features in your software that I absolutely have loved and looking at it is the branded caller ID. And how are you doing that? Yeah. You're essentially saying, hey, hey, it's Todd's company with my logo and everything, and we're calling about X. Holy crap. I got to imagine your answer rates are just off the yeah. hook. Yeah, the goal from the beginning was to make sure that this conversation wasn't seen as something intrusive right. or bad, but actually an extension of the experience. So, you know, if you're going online looking for Purdue, you know, a certain class sure. and trying to figure it out, if you can do it yourself, fine. But if you can't and you're abandoning, but in that moment, a call comes in on your phone and it says Purdue and you answer it and they go, hey, Alex, I see you're on this class, but really the intro statistics this class is this other one. Can I help you figure out which of the professors or which of the start dates you need? I love it. it. It becomes something additive instead of subtractive. And so as brands get known for doing it the right way, like people will use that as a channel. And like when we interview customers, it's not that they don't like phone conversations, it. it's that they don't like spam. Totally. You know, if they know it's something from a brand that they're trying to engage yep. with, that's going to be helpful. You know, from an ambassador from that brand who knows what they're talking about, people are very excited to use that. It's actually much easier and faster to talk through something than it is than to chat. do any of these other things. <laughs> right, right. No, chat, email. Yeah. Don't get me started on this <laughs> with a bot who like, Keep waiting for five minutes. Keep waiting for five minutes like I'll go crazy. <laughs> so, totally, totally. I feel your pain. Now, this is a very, very cool solution. And for those of you who have an existing outbound, particularly outbound call response system in your business model, you need to look at this software. You need to look at what they're doing. This is absolutely a game changer. Um, I, I Googled and looked up competition. There's not a lot of people doing it as good as Regal's doing this. And so Alex, I love, I love what you're doing. I love the brand. This is a very, very cool solution. Thank you. So looking at your solution and looking at your business and looking at your business model, talk us through what was kind of the origin to like that key decision where you said, okay, this is the problem we want to solve. And this is what people seem to want. Let's dive into this. What would that look like for you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, just to give you some order of scale, like our main investor is Emergence, who's a sort of well-known SaaS VC. Right. And uh, one of their more famous investments was Zoom. You know, we grew <laughs> faster than Zoom. You Are know? you serious? So I think there was something very special, you know, as we started talking to people where people really needed this. Wow. If I go back and look at what happened or why it happened, I'd say one thing I sort of point to particularly is that we were look, we were sort of uh, in a market where we had what sometimes is called like an earn secret or a learn secret, right? right? And that 
my co-founder has spent years in a home services business online. So we own our business on Angie's List and Home Advisor, right. where we struggled with this problem and found the answer ourselves. And, you know, very few people had been through that experience. Sure. And so there weren't lots of people out there building software to do this. You know, I think that quadrant of business where you're or that type of business, right, where you're doing something that is very valuable to customers, but not a lot of people know about it, like that's a good place to right, be, right? right? So, you know, you want to be something that's contrary to the common narrative. So what's the common narrative? Well, phone is dead. Nobody answers the phone. Cool. So no one's building business in there. I love it. But if you actually do build a business, we did, it turns out that a lot of customers need it. And it is something that's very valuable. Right. So, you know, sometimes people talk about this as like build an unsexy business. Yeah. I don't know that it has to be sexy or unsexy, just it has, you know, I call this sometimes the golf course problem of private equity. So guess who owns every business that's related to golf? Well, the private equity companies. Why? Because all the private equity guys play golf and they go, who owns that golf cart? Who owns that, you know, ball washing machine? Who owns that tee box totally. thing? It's just what they see when they buy the company. So stay away from the things that everyone else is looking <laughs> at if you want to have true unique. I am so glad you're here. And I just wanted to take a few seconds to tell you about a program that we have assembled with a lot of our podcast guests and a lot of people who are listening to the show who are feeling the same way that they do. There's a recurring theme. You'll hear a lot of these founders talk about, I couldn't have done it without my team. I couldn't have done it without a, a support group of peers. I couldn't have done it without having someone to talk to that understood my feeling of isolation as an operator of my business. You see, you're not alone. It is hard running a business, and it's even harder when you know you can't express all your deepest concerns and frustrations with your executive team. It makes them nervous. It gets them scared. You don't want scared people on your executive team. So where do you turn? The Captain's Council is where you turn. The Captain's Council it is an organization that we are put together with podcast guests, as well as people who are listening who are in the same boat. You see, peers are the only ones that can give you the type of empathy, the type of advice that only a founder or operator know and understand. Go check it out at captainscouncil.com. I know you're gonna love what you see there. We have put together an organizational structure that has small group settings, a global community of founders and operators, as well as monthly and quarterly in-person events. You're going to love what you see there. I can't wait for you to check it out and enjoy the rest of this episode. I love that. That's fantastic. So, but everybody's using call center. I mean, what, what inspired you to dive into this space? I mean, were you previously a contact center owner or what, what was kind of the, how did you evolve yeah, into this? Okay. In the home services space, we had a 5,000 person call center. Makes so we sense. had a big call center and we'd use a lot of different tools. Yeah. Um, and when we realized how important sort of these, these sort of proactive engagement conversations were, right. we actually went, we were using, um, uh, I won't even say, we were using one of the big, big players at the time. We were probably spending, I don't know, 15, $20 million a year with them. Right. So we were like a real customer. Right, right, And right. we went to them and said, hey, build some, you know, tools for us to help us do this better. They told us to pound sand. <laughs> so I don't know that it was a wrong decision for them. Like they had a very good business on the support side moving people from traditional on-prem sports solutions to the cloud right. they're growing and they're building features there. And we were, you know, asking them to do this thing on the outbound side where they thought outbound was dying and voice was dying. So they didn't do it. So in Crazy. the end, like that was the opportunity for us. Like, you know, we saw what was happening firsthand and they weren't going to react. That's crazy. Okay. So, so what you just said is two awesome things. One is sometimes the people you look at as potentially your biggest competitor just aren't willing to budge. They're focused, they're laser focused, and they don't really care about what you're going to do. Second thing is you saw the opportunity and said, this can't be that hard. Let's build a nice premise, a nice cloud solution that we can tap, tack into and add into it the things that we actually need. Chances are someone else needs that, mm -hmm. right? I know, the crazy part is now we went direct for the first couple of our customers, but now that we're at some scale, uh, we've started partnering with those big traditional <laughs> contact center software companies because they never invested in the outbound tools and they see that we did and they go, oh, we want that for our, I love uh, it. you know, we want that for our, 
was how do you bring it back into our tool? So That's you know, they're not fools. Like they see when they're wrong and they know they're not going to invest in it. And so now we've started working together. That's funny. That's funny. And we can get nerdy later because I, I've also built, uh, you know, some solutions for my contact center as well. We, we, you know, we'll get, we'll get into that later off, off the air because that will just bore people to death. But this is a really cool solution. And I honestly, that decision had to have been one of the key things that started the business. But looking at client acquisition and the way that you were bringing people into your company, was there a key thing that you looked at and said, okay, that right there changed the whole trajectory of what we were doing? Yeah, you know, for sure. I think we made some decisions uh, that other people don't early on. So like, just as a couple examples, we started selling before we had a product. Good. People go, what do you mean? Like, how do you like, well, you know, we didn't want to spend a year building something to show it to people just to get the feedback that it was wrong. Right. So the first thing we showed people was a deck. Right. And we got feedback on that and iterated on the deck long before we ever built anything. You know, when we did finally build things, like we built very, very thin software, right? right. Using as little like software as possible to get feedback. And then based on the feedback, we then, you know, got deeper. So at this point, we have a very sophisticated tool, you know, three, right. four years in. Right. But at the beginning, it wasn't. What we were doing was we were, you know, adding value to people, even if the software wasn't sophisticated. Interesting. Um, so that was one sort of decision. The other one is, you know, I sold the first three million in AR myself like nice. there wasn't anybody else and so that meant that i was much closer to what customers were asking for what was going on i think too early people start adding people into the process and now all those learnings are split across four or five people instead of one right. and it slows everything down so maybe i should have like started getting some help fa faster in three million but right. we sold three million in a year so i don't know but uh that's cool. definitely like that was helpful the person that was like the, the, at the end, you know, tip of the spear at the beginning. Right. Um, and, you know, founders sometimes ask me when they should hire salespeople and I'm like, well, you know, not until you've gotten pretty far. Like, right. Make sure you're the one doing. Well, um, that's good advice. I'm trying to think of other... I was going to yeah. that's good advice because a lot of, a lot of people do jump into hiring a sales guy before they even have their first sales done. And it's like, you're not going to yeah. get that feedback that you need to pivot and modify and adjust product unless you're hearing it directly from the clients. And so that's something really important that, that I feel like you've really exemplified. I think maybe you did bring it a little too far <laughs> going all the way to 3 million before you got some other guys involved, but it helped. And it was only one year. And that's fantastic that you were able to do that in one year. Yeah. Yeah. No, if I think about the other things we did differently early on, you know, uh, I'd say we believe generally like in smaller teams. So like, I don't know, some people agree with me, but you know, we don't believe that like more people solve the problem. And so right. we stayed very lean for a long time. Like we used vendors as much as possible rather than rebuilding things ourselves. Like right. we focused right. on the area where we were going to be most differentiating, not on things that like we could use from other people. Smart. I mean, sometimes the way I frame this is to say, you know, once upon a time, businesses were a thousand employees and 10 vendors. Today it's 10 employees and a thousand vendors, right? No Recognize doubt. that shift, be ready for it. Like, you know, you should be thinking through like, how do you maximize what you're doing by managing vendors rather than doing it yourself? Love it. Um, because it can be a very, especially early on, a very good way to accelerate your growth without having to build it yourself. I love it. I, I can't emphasize that enough as well. I, I think that uh, to your point, starting off with a very thin product, but making it very aware to your clients that this is what we're thinking, try this out and give us feedback is one of the best ways to to not overburden yourself with so much overhead up front and you front load your cost when you don't even know what the customer really wants. Uh, I just had a conversation yeah. with a with a startup yesterday about a very similar thing that he was trying to produce and and we had a very similar conversation. So it's actually very validating that you're saying what you're saying because I encourage him to do the same thing. Don't go into heavy production until you get a few people to beta or alpha what it is you're trying to do. Let them know it's an alpha but we'll get the feedback you need so you can know where to dive into and really put your, your dev. Yeah. I mean, the other, you know, thing I, you know, I feel for a lot of sort of founders that are first time founders where yeah. they spend a lot of their time in the first year solving problems that are known problems, but they've never been through it themselves before. And so like right. they're wasting time. Right. I encourage people to like go spend a year or two at another startup, like learn on somebody else's dime before you go sure. launch your own thing. Sure. Learn, like, how do you hire? How do you manage teams? How do you fire? Yeah. How do you 
do some communication in a company, like watch the founders do all that. They won't do it all right, but see what you like, what you don't like. So right. by the time that comes up for you, you're not wasting cycles on that kind of stuff, which can no completely doubt. waste your time. And you're spending the time on, you know, what is the go to market motion, you know, that we're going to do, you know, what is our product, uh, you know, feature that's going to be next, like on the things that are going to make you different than everybody else, not yep. the things that are just the same as everybody else. Yep. Totally agree. Totally agree. I love, I love this advice. I love this session of the podcast because I want to ask you personally, you know, I know you've had other businesses that you've launched and, and exited, but in this particular business, as you've been growing it, was there an unexpected, I mean, there always is, but like, what is an example of an unexpected challenge that kind of caught you off guard that you weren't really prepared for? And what did you do about it? Yeah, sure. You know, the, the, uh, to be a founder is, you know, to, to sort of do two things. One, uh, tell the same story again and again and every day. So like, you better right. like the story because you're going to be repeating it. <laughs> but uh, also totally. like, you know, to be on this roller coaster, right? Where one minute, like the greatest thing ever happens and the next minute, the most terrible thing happens. And the people that just have the perseverance to keep moving towards that goal that they've been repeating to everybody right. else, and like people who believe the thing they're saying do very well. Yeah. The people who like, the, they believe the highs or they believe the lows, like, you know, whatever the expression is, this too shall pass. If people right. won't believe it too much, you know, I think struggle. Um, you know, if I think about things that went wrong, I mean, there's a million of them, uh, you know, from the, you know, from the very beginning, like I remember at some point talking to VCs going, what are you talking about? Like what, this isn't a business. Yeah. And you learn that, well, those are the VCs that don't deal in this kind of product and right. they just don't understand the situation. The ones right. we talk to, who knew the problem situation, go, okay, this is exciting. Here's money. So seriously, you know, very early in the morning, like you have to make sure you're talking to the right people. I think in our case, like, you know, COVID really changed the business. We thought we were going to be in a position where we'd all be working together and like, right. be easy and all of a sudden no more. And so we decided very early on, we wanted to keep an office. And so three yeah. days a week was always the plan other than like one month when it got really bad in like a January, we've always yeah. had people in the office. And like, that was like a whole new thing to explore. And like, I remember when like, there was an engineer who lived in, uh, we were trying to hire an engineer who lived in Brooklyn. Yeah. And he goes, well, my rate is 150 if I work from home or it's, you know, 170 if you want me coming to the office three days a week. And we're like, God, you live in Brooklyn. Like our office is in Manhattan. Like what's going on? <laughs> like it's shifted now. Like that's not the way. But like, that was how crazy it got. Yeah. You know, uh, then like you know, there were vendors that like didn't deliver. Like we thought like we had vendors that were committed to do thing over a period. And even right. though there were contracts, they changed the whole thing or they don't deliver on the thing they're supposed to. And like that then has ripple on effects to our customers. 100%. Um, you know, or if you think about like hiring, like, you know, we've made some bad hires where, you know, for sure, like we think that we're pretty good at it and, and yeah. we're very proud of the people on the team. But there are times where you get it wrong and you have to yeah. then take a deep breath and like figure out like why, why did you get it wrong? Like, why is it the wrong match? They may be great, but just not great for this business and help them find the totally. right thing instead of staying, you know, with this. I, I love that all four examples that you just shared are perfect examples of, I'm mean, honestly, we could do a whole episode on every one of those four because I think they're super valid. Yeah. And uh, you know, <laughs> when dealing with vendors, you got to expect that they're not going to act perfectly all the time. Their model changes just like your model might change. And so if you yeah. have them doing a specific thing you need, have three vendors to do the same thing and just determine which one is more aligned with what you're doing, right? And, and there's so yeah. many quick fixes to the things that you talked about, but they are challenges that you've got to face and you got to expect because as a founder, I loved how you, you kind of identified that there's two primary roles. You got to innovate and you got to just fix problems all the time. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah. You know, I think the, the sort of job of a founder changes is the business scale changes. So like definitely what I do today is quite different than, you know, when we were 10 people like in a room. Right. Um, but yeah, I think those things are pretty true throughout. Uh, the hard part, I think, as a founder, particularly in my opinion, is knowing at what point in time do you put in place more process on any given right. thing. And when I say process, what I really mean is whether it's technology or people or a uh, you know, like literally a process, like when do you do that? Because if you do yeah. it too early on whatever thing, 
you just slow the business down. You do it too late, everything's breaking. So take like HR as an example. Like yeah. you have, you know, 10 people. Do you hire a VP of HR and get like a big HR system? Well, I don't know. You have 20 people do you do it. You have 30 people do you do it. You have 40 people do it. Right. Like knowing at what point in time you make that decision is important. Because, yeah. you know, if you think like, why well, I'm better because I did it earlier? No. Like you might've just slowed your whole company down. Totally. You know, or, hey, I'm a faster moving thing because I did it later. Well, no, you might've just like, create a world where you're going to have more HR totally. problems that are worth it. So totally the right time is important, not whether you do it faster or do it later. I love it. I love it. This has been so fun. It, this is seriously a really fun interview because a, I'm pretty familiar with the pain points that you're solving. B I think that your experiences are exemplifying what a lot of the listeners of this podcast are hearing and feeling. And that is, Oh man, I, I see where I want to go. I see the problem I'm solving, but boy, these challenges hit me in the face. And and maybe I'm not as dialed into my avatars I think I was. And maybe I'm not, you know, hitting hitting the language that I need to be using to, to identify who I want to work with. And B, C, who do I get to invest in me? Like these are all questions that people are wondering. And you just kind of went through very chronologically through all these issues that people face. And I, I appreciate it so much. Is there something that, uh, you know, I, I love to ask people, is there somebody, someone, some group, something that you do to maintain sanity as a founder when sometimes it's hard to, to bounce the problems off of your team? Yeah. Look, I've seen a lot of people with different solutions for me. Like I have a co-founder that like I'm very close with. Awesome. So we went into the yeah. business having worked together for 50 years. We're 50-50 in everything. So there's no power awesome. imbalance. Like in theory, I have a CEO title, but that is not how decisions are made. Like totally. you know, I, I'm sort of responsible for certain parts of the business and she's responsible for others. So Love I think it. that makes it much easier. I can't imagine people who have to go into it without a co-founder that they trust. Um, that is like by far like the easiest. Look, I have friends where they didn't have a co-founder and so they used an investor kind of as that, or they used the CEO pod group. And right. yeah, uh, there are ways to sort of compensate, but for sure, I'd encourage people like go find somebody you trust, and you know you want them to have a different skill set than you. It doesn't necessarily totally. have to be technical and non-technical. That's not the split anymore. Right. But you do want somebody who looks at the world a little differently, or you know, sort of has a you know set of skills that you don't have. Agreed. Agreed. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Get get someone with a different skill set, but somebody that understands the pain that you're feeling as a founder, because it does get lonely, and you're you are lucky to have a good partner. Uh, not everyone has a good partner. A lot of people have a partner, but not a good partner. And so find yeah. someone that does compliment you, not someone that's exactly like you, if you're looking for a partner in, in your venture that you're launching. Good advice. Alex, what do you think? The only other message I give people is like, the you know, why, why Combinator and the press have made like starting businesses very sexy. Yeah. Look, it's not. Honestly, it's not. Like I happen Painful. to like it. My co-founder likes it. But it's not right for most people. So like, don't go and like do it just because you see it in the press. Don't go and do it because your friends are doing it. Like if it's something that you can't avoid doing, you have to do it. <laughs> sure, then you should do it. Like, you know, don't do it otherwise because you're just going to like waste a couple of years of your life on something you're not having fun doing. You know, there's plenty and of then you end up not being passionate about it. Yeah, where you can go work with somebody else and, you know, help build that business out and have more freedom. You know, if you go right. start a business, like you better be committed to it for the long run. Agreed. Agreed. Alex, we appreciate so much your time today. I've got links to you and your business down below. If people want to reach out, best way to hit you, LinkedIn? Yeah. Always email me at hello at regal.io. Look, if you're cool. running, you know, outbound call centers and you want to chat about, you know, the fact that you're worried that your performance is getting worse, like come right. talk to us. Like there are other ways to do this. Right. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those listening, I hope you learned something valuable. Don't hesitate to throw some comments down below to ask Alex any question that you might have wished I would have asked or you want details on something else. Throw it in the comments. Both of us will respond. Love and appreciate y'all. Alex, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that interview. I absolutely loved it. Alex is one of those guys who's got experience. He's got industry smarts. He's got a very intuitive uh, sense of direction when he's leading a company. And I love the way he's guiding his company right now. If you're one of those people looking for advice, looking for not just advice, but experiences from other founders like Alex, who are there to help each other 
in times of need, look no further than captainscouncil.com. They're the sponsors of today's show, and you ought to just check and see if there's a group in there that makes sense for you to join. Because when you've got eight to 10 other CEOs who are actively running a business, hearing about your problems, hearing about your concerns, and even just diving into your product in general, it makes a difference. You know as well as I do that founders with founders come up with awesome ideas and awesome fixes to problems that are driving you nuts. So check out captainscouncil.com if you're one of those people who could use another ear to listen into what you got going on and keeping it confidential and giving you experiences that might help you make better decisions. Love it. Hope you love the interview. Hope you'll check out captainscouncil.com and we will catch up to you on the next episode.